is Tony Murphy. <laughs> and the third speaker is Maya Elastovic. <laughs> and in opposition for, uh, for this debate, we have the team from Singapore. <laughs> the first speaker is Benjamin Mutt. This House would offer dictators immunity in return for leaving power. It gives me great pleasure to invite the first speaker for the proposition team to open the debate. Please welcome. dead people. This is not just a number. This is a massacre and we need a solution. We need it now. We must stop the deaths of innocents. We must protect life. And seeing that other methods have failed, we, Team Argentina, propose that we offer immunity to dictators in exchange for them leaving power, only in the case of a political crisis. Now what don't do we understand by these terms? We believe dictators to be individuals or groups of people who have unrestricted control of governmental powers, people who govern illegitimately over their country, and we believe a dictatorship in political crisis to be one where there is social turmoil, possibly leaving the country in the verge of a civil war. We believe that there is popular discontent, that this proves that there is popular discontent, and we believe that th this creates a threat a significant threat to a significant minority or even a majority of the population of the country. Immunity for us is the exemption of juridical prosecution of so, punishment, no thank you, for crimes during government, and leaving power is abandoning and officially resigning from the office of charge of uh, an official, or in this case, dictator. Now, what is the situation we have? What is the meaning behind this motion? The fact of the matter is we have dictatorships in political crisis all over the world, and people are dying, there are innocent people dying, being murder, murdered on the streets. We cannot stand by and have their blood flow through the rivers of their country. We cannot permit this. And that is Point why we, you, no, we, and that is why we, we provide a realistic solution to this problem. A solution that ends the threat to the population without actually hurting more innocents than the problem has created or other solutions do. That is why Point we do nothing. That is why we, we suggest we provide immunity to dictators in order to end this threat. And how will we prove that this is the best option, that this motion will stand, most definitely stand? We'll prove this with three basic points. First of all, that life always comes before ethics. Second of all, that this is the only realistic option we have. And lastly, the consequences of these situations in a globalized world. So, Yes, please. Uh, last week, a Spanish delegation offered amnesty to the Syrian dictator Omar al-Bashir, but he rejected them. What guarantees do you have that dictators will accept your offer? First of all, we're not saying that they will, that we, they will necessarily accept the offer, because that's why it's an offer. We are suggesting that we offer this to provide a solution. We do not know if this will work, but we believe it will. Second of all, this, the, I will develop the model and show to you how uh, the offer made by Spain did not actually apply within this sort of situation. Why? Well, because what we are saying, what Team Argentina is proposing, is that the International Criminal Court, not a single country or, or a small organization, s provides this immunity rationally personally to not just to the dictators, but the senior officials of the government in question, as long as they immediately so, leave office and leave the country. Uh, the country to which they will leave will provide physical protection to them as, as best seems fit. Further on, this is not an extended uh, question or matter. What we are saying is that we should do, we should provide a deadline. This is an offer that expires. This is a time period after which the offer expires. And this time period will be decided according to the gravity of the situation within the country. 
Now we understand this is not the ideal option, but basically if we look at the statistics, if we look at the numbers, what are the real chances of al-Assad waking up tomorrow in Syria and saying, well, this is just too stressful, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'm just going to leave and hand over power to a democratic and peaceful government that has the will of the people in matter. Ladies and gentlemen, statistically speaking, Point of information, no, like, statistically speaking, the chances of him being having a working burnout because of a dictatorship are very, very small and tiny. That is why we suggest a realistic approach to the matter. That is why we suggest immunity, because on top of that, other solutions, alternatives, have exacerbated the problem. As my second speaker will develop, diplomatic isolation in Sudan and Syria, economic sanctions in Myanmar and Iraq, and military intervention in Kosovo and Libya have exacerbated the problem and failed to help the situation. Now moving on to my constructive case. So, no, thank you. Life before ethics. What is it that Team Argentina believes in? We believe in life. We believe that when people are being murdered, we must save innocents. We must end this situation as soon as possible even if it means sacrificing justice. Because this, this is a good Point cause. of information, sir. Yes, please. By rewarding dictators for the crimes, you give them every incentive to commit more of the atrocities that you claim to at home. Could you, no, I, could you repeat the first part, I'm sorry. By rewarding dictators for their crimes by granting them immunity, you give them every um, reason to commit more of the atrocities just, you at home. Now, this, as I will prove, is not necessarily true, especially because my second speaker will show to you that this is the only option that we have. Now, this will be developed later on in our case. Now, moving back to life before ethics. Make a trip. Go to Sudan, Syria, Myanmar, Libya, if you really have the time and money, and if you don't, are not afraid of the situation there. And go ask any mother in any village if she would rather have the dictator tried and punished, or if she would rather have her son back home, alive and well, in her arms. Ladies and gentlemen, so, no thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if my family was at risk, I know what I would want. I would want them to be safe. But even if the situation was solved somehow else, non-immunity does not actually equal justice, ladies and gentlemen. There are two ways on which dictatorship can fall, historically. First of all, is violence. Second of all, is deal brokering. Now, violence usually ends up with the killing of the dictator, the murder of the dictator, like in Guatemala or in Romania. And where's the justice in this? There is no justice because there is no trial or punishment. This is just pure vengeance and violence, ladies and gentlemen. Points. This is not justice. Thus, in the case of Guatemala and Romania, people, people later regretted the fact that they had killed the dictator because there was no real justice within society. Further on, Deal brokering, the second option, does not actually involve justice usually in, the, in most cases or half the time or most of the cases because it usually ends up with under the table negotiations and basically you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Take for example the cases of so, Chile where the dictator, uh, where the dictator uh, was, came, down from, came down from being the head of the country only to become senator for the rest of his life, ladies and gentlemen. There is no justice in this. Or in Uruguay where the dictators were given amnesty and walked the streets like free men, all the riches they had accumulated during the dictatorship completely untouched. Now, what do we see? We see that immunity saves lives on the one hand, even if it has to sacrifice just for a good cause, and secondly, that even if we do not provide immunity, this does not necessarily involve justice in society. So, ladies and gentlemen, close your eyes for just a moment, and think, a cruel despot were to take your family away from you, what would you want? Would you want your tri a trial? Would you want this so-called punishment? Or would you rather have your family back with you, safe and sound, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much. Team Argentina dares to propose. That's the first opposition speaker for his speech.
let's open the case for the opposition and call upon Benjamin Mack. Let's come straight out and state opposition's position with regard to this debate. We think in line with the status quo, dictators will be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court, as we've seen with Jean-Pierre Bemba, for crimes committed in the Central African Republic. We support the removal of dictators by force where possible and any subsequent efforts at reconstruction. We stand by the base principle that offering dictators immunity in exchange for their leaving power normalizes oppression and rewards brutality. And we're going to show this through three constructive arguments. First, why it's immoral and ineffective. Second, why it denies victims closure and perpetuates social strife. And lastly, my second speaker will argue that it pushes dictators toward further brutality. Before I hit my positive matter, let's talk about the case you've seen from proposition. And I'm going to do this by asking two questions. Which side guarantees practical effectiveness? And second, I'm going to ask whether it's really true that we can stand for life before ethics. So let's look at the first issue about practical effectiveness. And what we saw from opposition, from proposition was an assertion that other methods to deal with dictators have failed. We disagree. We've seen successes with military interventions carried out under the United Nations mandate in Ivory Coast, no thank you sir, just earlier this year, with Alassane Ouattara being taken down and replaced by a democratic president. We think such military interventions can be carried out with minimal loss of life, contrary to what proposition is saying, no thank you. We've seen this very simply because of the fact that civilians don't want to help a dictator who's oppressing them, so it's pretty simple to differentiate between civilians and those who are militarily backing the dictator. But we further question whether or not their offer is in fact going to be accepted, because all the help, all the benefits, no thank you madam, that they've talked about so far with regard to dictators leaving power can only come when such offers are accepted. We think it's not going to happen, especially after the international community betrayed Charles Taylor in 2006 when Nigeria handed him over to the International Criminal Court, despite the fact that he'd been granted immunity in 2003. We think their offers aren't going to work in the present, as we've shown further with the argument about serious dictator we raised earlier. And furthermore, we think what dictators are going to do is use it to play for time in negotiations that's going to allow them to stay in power for even longer, no thank you, as we've seen in North Korea, where what they've essentially been doing is hold the world hostage with their nuclear weapons to continue getting food aid, to continue holding the world to rats. So that's the first contention done. Let's look now at the question of life before ethics. And we think it's rather demeaning of their side to say that the sacrifices made by people on the streets in Syria, in Libya, even in Tunisia, where Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire because of his anger against the dictator uh, Zine al, -Al, -Al Abidin Ben Ali in Tunisia. We think in all these cases, people have shown a willingness to sacrifice their lives for the sake of bringing dictators to justice. And we think they are not in the position to question their willingness to sacrifice their lives because we think it's the people who should decide in this case. In fact, we think it's going to encourage even more harm on the part of dictators if we're going to allow for offers of immunity because of the fact that they're going to be encouraged to be rewarded for their brutality. Now that the international community says, we're going to give you immunity. My second speaker is going to develop that further, but you disagree. Yeah, I do. Do you think that the, that the children involved, those 15,000 deaths in Libya, were willing to sacrifice their lives? We're not talking about unjustified sacrifices here. We're talking about bringing dictators to justice, and we're talking about ending the war as soon as possible so that those 15,000 children you're talking about won't have to die. That's what we're standing for on our side of the house. And lastly, we're going to question their idea that no justice is going to be brought if military intervention occurs, because the dictator and all his elites will simply be killed. No, what we're going to do on our side is to continue to bring them to justice even after military interventions have occurred, as we've seen with war, tri war crimes tribunals in Yugoslavia and most, success most recently in Cambodia. So we don't think it's not going to be, be able to bring dictators to justice. So that's my second contention done. No, thank you. Let's move on to our positive matter now, which is going to further deal with their case. I'm going to first talk about why granting dictators immunity is immoral and ineffective. And here, our thesis is that offering dictators immunity rewards that brutality without ending it. Our first premise is that granting immunity to dictators means they will never have to pay for their crimes. Now, Omar al-Bashir's massacres against tens of thousands of Christians in Darfur will go unpunished. Instead, 
we offer him a ticket to a free safe haven if we accept their model. Hence, we lose our ability to stop the emergence of future dictators and prevent violation of the most basic of humanitarian laws. Indeed, as a matter of principle, we would never grant dictators immunity because their crimes are so heinous. There is strong precedence for this. The world revoked immunity for Chile's dictator, no thank you, Augusto Pinochet, and Libya's strongman Muammar Gaddafi, despite this forestalling talks with either of them. In any case, dictators will probably reject an offer of immunity for two reasons. First, dictators are addicted to the power they enjoy in their countries. Second, dictators don't trust such offers, as I've explained with the track record of Charles Taylor beforehand. But you disagree. I definitely do, because dictatorships in political crisis, the dictator is in risk of losing this power, so he, look, he will look for an option out of, out of this danger. We think they won't look for such options, as you've seen with Bashar al-Assad in Syria, because of the fact that dictators aren't exactly the rational-minded people you're talking about. In Watch fact, permission. no thank you, madam. The Spanish delegation that offered him immunity was reported as saying that Syrian officials were very far detached from reality when they were considering whether or not to accept such, such offers. So we don't agree with what you're saying. But let's move back to my point. So we've seen massive betrayals for dictators, and so dictators haven't accepted offers of immunity, and thus, we shouldn't grant it to them because it's immoral and won't work. Let's now talk about why it denies victims closure and perpetuates social strife. Our thesis is that offering dictators immunity stops the closure for victims of dictatorial oppression and stops the process of reconciliation in the societies they once ruled. Now, having suffered permanent scars at the hands of dictators, the victims of their atrocities deserve at least closure from knowing dictators have been duly punished. If we grant them immunity, no thank you, what happens is we hinder this process. Dictators cannot scot free, while their victims are left to struggle in the quagmire they have left behind, which amounts to double jeopardy. Separately, dictators realize that the world is desperate for their departure, hence they are likely to attach numerous conditions in exchange for them leaving power, such as the protection of key military officers guilty of crimes against humanity. Thus, granting immunity to dictators exonerates the people who are better to savagery, further rubbing salt into the wounds of their victims, encouraging them to turn violent. We saw this in 2011, when huge violent protests erupted in Yemen when Saudi Arabia tried to offer immunity to its dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. Indeed, the lack of closure for victims is likely to foment conflict between them and groups who previously patronized the dictator. This ignites a cycle of hatred and violence which we saw in Iraq when Shia street gangs hunted down and killed Ba'ath Party supporters even though former dictator Saddam Hussein had been hanged. Had Saddam been let off the hook, such violence is likely to have surged exponentially. To stop such bloodshed, we must offer victims closure by bringing dictators to justice, not granting them immunity. What has the opposition shown you today? We've shown, first of all, why dictators don't deserve immunity because it's immoral and ineffective. Secondly, why it denies victims closure. And lastly, why it in fact ignites a cycle of further bloodshed. We want to stop. speaker for his speech. case which, um, which will, I would develop two points. One, explaining how this is our only option, both to solve the problem and for the dictator himself, and the consequences that this situation brings in a globalized world. I will, I will start by refuting, by refuting some of the points proposed by the opposition. 
And the opposition questioned, how does this, uh, how does our offering uh, guarantee any type of effectiveness? Well, I would like to, re to remind you that the, uh, that the motion before us says this house will offer immunity to dictators in return for the living power. This meaning that the, the key word here being offering. They came up with one, uh, with one example being the one of Spain uh, stating that this point of information not the starting, is stating how Spain did not work. Well, what we're, trying, what we're going to prove here is that I'm going to name a, a, a different cases in which all the uh, status quo of methods are not working. And this explaining how one example of how this offering of immunity did not work does not bring the whole case down. We're talking, they said that this does not bring or it's not going to be applicable for the present. But we, ladies and gentlemen, we're thinking about the future as well. We think about the lives we can prevent, not yeah. the lives, not, not seeking, just a minute, not seeking to justify the lives that are already that already happened, yes. If you have listened to Benjamin's speech, he gave you systemic reasons why dictators will never accept your offers of immunity now or in the future. Thank Here you, that's your point. I'm going to develop that in my, in my first argument. Now, they, uh, they used the, uh, the term sacrifice lives, how people were willing to do this in order to bring, uh, to bring the dictator down. Now, I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, the people in Libya, as I mentioned in my point of information, uh, 15,000 people died, it's, uh, it's, and Libya is an ongoing conflict. So how can uh, this uh, death be justified? How can this sacrifice, this sacrifice of lives can possibly bring any solution if you can see that this is an ongoing uh, conflict? Also, they said that, um, that what we are offering, this immunity, is a reward. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is hardly a reward or whatsoever. What we are, uh, what we are saying is that uh, not only the, the moral condemnation, but we must bear in mind that our importance here is not only to bring, uh, what we are prioritizing is saving lives. Bringing justice, as my first speaker said, will not bring back the baby to their, to their mother's arm. What we are looking for is preventing this from happening again. So if we are, if we are looking for, uh, if we're, uh, no, thank you. If we're encouraging this sacrifice, sacrificing of lives, if we're uh, putting this forward as a good attitude, what we're doing is only promoting more death, and this is certainly what we are not aiming to, what we're not aiming for. So what we're, so what we're, uh, no, thank you. Um, another point that they said is that this stops uh, the process of closure. I'm sorry if I didn't see the point in this, but we are. They talk about the victims and how they need to uh, have a closure on this terrible tragedy that happens. Yes, we agree on the point that this is a terrible tragedy, and because we understand what this uh, what this horrible thing you what this horrible situation implies, this is why justly the reason that they say that this is why we are looking to avoid this from happening again, from not encouraging this type of of um, situation. Point and matter. no, thank you. And uh, and. When they said that this is not a, a, a serve for uh, allowing for closure. Well, let me ask you, does military intervention allow for closure? Does diplomatic isolation allow for, cl for closure? Does economic sanctions allow for closure? This I will address on my, on my, on my, uh, on my argument, uh, which states how this is our only option, both for us to solve the problem and for the dictator himself. The other, um, why did the other options work? First, going to military intervention. Point intervention? No, thank you. Military intervention, uh, the only thing that has brought to the table is that it hurt civilians. They talk about how uh, this allows for closure. Well, let me ask you. If the, if the, race, if the casualty, if civilian casualty ratio in Kosovo was 4 to 1, does it allow for closure? This ratio means that every one soldier that got killed, four people oh, died. Man. Let me finish this. Four innocent people died. Yes. You say you want to protect lives in the future, but by removing the deterrence you place on dictators, all you do is encourage more dictators to rise in their place. I hardly think that there is a, that is a case, as I just said, that this is hardly a reward. What we are looking for is a short-term, realistic, immediate problem to this uh, solution, to this problem that we have in our hands. We are not looking for an encouragement. Let's be realistic, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A dictator, a dictator, if he gets to power, he's going to be a dictator anyway. He's not going to say, oh, now that I have immunity, I'm going to go, to, and I'm going to go into this uh, because I have this type of motivation. This is not the case because we specifically said that we are talking about dictators, dictatorships in crisis. So what, what are you going to say? I hope I, I become a dictator, I hope I go into a crisis, and I hope I get immunity. I'm sorry, but this is not what we are offering. So, moving on to my second argument, which, uh, to my second 
example of military intervention where it failed, as I already mentioned, Libya. Up to today, uh, 15,000 people died, and they say that this sacrifice, sacrifice of life was as a minimum number of deaths. I'm sorry if we are Team Argentina do not believe that 15,000 people is a minimum number of deaths. Now, why did the economic sanctions do not work? Let's take, for instance, the case of Iraq in the 1990s. Uh, Iraq was implied, uh, implied economic sanctions affecting the oil industry of the country and therefore affecting the whole of the economy. What did this bring? Did Saddam Hussein uh, have, a, uh, have a, a decrease in his style life? Did he stop having huge banquets and dinners and servants uh, 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 in his palace? No, this affected the poor and vulnerable sections of society. So, uh, this, uh, uh, this economic sanction in, no, thank you, in Iraq in 1990s caused a famine, and this killed thousands. So this can, so in this way you can see that economic sanction actually brought more deaths than it saved. And on top of this, Saddam Hussein remained in power for what, 10 more years? So what we're trying to prove here is economic sanctions and military intervention for now did not work and did not bring any type of solution. Take for instance also that this also applies to the case of Myanmar. For shortages, people died in Myanmar, and obviously after being imposed economic sanctions, the dictator was not, going to, was not a, a, a accepting international help for the people that were dying because they had no food. So I'm sorry if I believe that economic sanction is well, not a solution, but on the contrary, worsening and exacerbating the problem. Yes? If they're not even willing to accept diplomatic help for their own people, what makes you think these leaders will accept your offers of immunity? Uh, why did they, didn't, uh, for example, in Myanmar accept the international help? Because in the first place, they were, uh, they were imposed with economic sanctions. We are saying that by offering this immunity, we're not doing an open statement of opposition saying we're trying to isolate you from everything and try to, and are, are aiming for this to work. All they did, all they managed was, pe was for people to die, created more deaths. So we can see that economic sanction is not, is not the way to go. Now, diplomatic isolation, why didn't this work? Because, let's be realistic, as my first speaker said, <coughs> Uh, the dictator uh, is not going to wake up someday and say, hey, I'm just going to resign now because I've got better things to do. Like, I have to move on to another project, like, I know, feeding people in Africa. This is not going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be realistic. That is our approach today. That is our key word, realism. Dictator is not going to be affected by diplomatic isolation. Let's take the, for example, for example like the case of Syria. Syria has had diplomatic isolation imposed since the 80s. And where are we now? Just look around or, or read the newspapers. There is an ongoing conflict there. Now, this is not bring any short-term uh, short -term solution and it's not effective for the dictator. As I said, the dictator is not going to step down by by its own. So, by offering immunity, we're guaranteeing us, us some, self, some sort of uh, self-security for the dictator that will be his motivation to accept this offer. So, stating, after stating that all the uh, status quo are not a, are a, are a methods do not work, and by proving that this is our only solution, we, Team Argentina, believe that this is our only way to save lives and prevent this from happening again. Thank you very much. the second proposition speaker for her speech. one which normalizes oppression and rewards brutality. I have three points of contention. Firstly, I am going to examine the self-defeating policy that they presented to us. Then I'm going to ask the question, who really saves lives? And last of all, I'm going to examine why our methods and our alternatives are much better than the policy that they have proposed to us. So first, let's examine the self-defeating policy. 
They first told us that their policy only kicks in in cases where dictators are in a political crisis. We think these cases are, first of all, vanishingly minute. There's hardly any dictator who is in a political crisis, because the very nature of a dictatorship is that all alternative forms of rule and government are systemically stamped out. If your policy is never going to apply in the real world, then we tell you it's not a very good policy at all. And that's why they can't prove to us cases where their policy won't even apply. No, thank you. But they could mean another thing when they say this is a political crisis. Maybe they mean that the dictator is so weak that he's going to lose power anyway because of, for instance, a violent civil revolution, as we saw in the Middle East and the revolts there. Then the reply is fairly simple. If they're going to lose power anyway, why on earth are you going to offer them immunity if you're not going to make any active change, no thank you, to the situation within that country? But they could mean another thing if they say the situation is unstable politically. Maybe they mean that the social situation there is extremely unstable and the dictator has to resort to violent and oppressive methods in order to quell that. We tell you, in these cases, offering immunity doesn't do anything at all. And this is where Ben's analysis, which he never talked about, about why dictators tend to refuse such offers of immunity when untouched. They keep talking about the 15,000 people who die under Gaddafi. Wait a minute. We tried to offer Gaddafi immunity. That was your model, and he refused it. We tell you there's a very clear reason why they will always refuse these. Because they want to keep that hold on power. And as Ben told you, I'll take in a moment, ma'am, they tend to be quite isolated from the reality when they are in danger. They retreat into their own siege mentality and become more insular and more oppressive. That's why they don't accept these offers in the first place. Yes. Being aware of what happened with Gaddafi and how we rejected the, the, the offer, we changed our model and introduced the ICC and the, and the deadline ultimatum. So. That's rather bizarre. That's a massive concession. You said you want to save as many lives as possible. Now you seem to be implying that if by the deadline you haven't accepted it, we'll go and like militarily intervene anyway. So we think that's a massive concession on your part. Let's move on to my second point of rebuttal, therefore. Who saves more lives? I'd like to first point out that their policy causes more deaths in the future because what they do is remove any prosecutorial power the international community may have had against these dictators. You tell the dictators, we are so desperate to save lives that if you're very brutal, we are going to offer these, we are going to make these offers of immunity that incentivizes oppression. Secondly, you're not doing anything to remove an immensely corrupt government, bureaucracy, and a highly unaccountable and brutal military, no thank you, within these countries. Removing one man at the top doesn't remove the institution that collectively oppresses the people. But thirdly, Ben told you, no thank you, that people in these countries are anyway very willing to take massive risks to their life to overthrow these dictators. That's why massive protests broke out despite the fact that governments tried very hard to clamp down. You can't tell us that people are unwilling to make sacrifices because if anything about the Middle East revolutions has shown us something new, it's that people are willing to make massive sacrifices to overthrow oppressive regimes. So you do not save more lives. Let's move on then to our policy and when we think ours is vastly feasible in comparison to theirs. They try to portray our policy as a one-size-fits-all, let's just invade policy. It's not. What we said was, we'll have a vast toolbox of measures that exist in the status quo. None of these will include the offer of immunity. And as I go through my point of substantive, I'm going to be showing you why these alternatives work in comparison to their flawed policy. Let me move therefore to my point of substantive, about why offering dictators immunity creates a perverse incentive for them to oppress and to brutalize their people even more. Let's first examine the sort of incentive structures that their policy is going to create. What they want to do is, in effect, to reward dictators precisely because their actions are so despicable. That's their own logic. Point they said that, I'll take you in a moment, ma'am. They said that it's precisely because he's brutal that we want to make these offers in the first place. I yes. absolutely don't change what we said because I, I actually, uh, specifically said this is not a reward, we're trying to solve a solution and avoid deaths from happening, not giving him a gift. It is a reward to a criminal to tell him you will never ever be punished for the hundreds of thousands of deaths you cause. When you'll be living in a villa for the rest of your life on a state pension because that's what an offer of immunity does actually mean in the real world. So let's be clear, it is a reward and don't let him tell you otherwise. No thank you. What this means is that it creates a very perverse incentive for dictators to oppress their people. Because the only effective change they're going to make is to let a dictator hold an entire country hostage by committing even worse crimes for an even longer period of time. Because now he knows that the international community will be forced to bend over backward to fulfill every whim of his. 
And we tell you that given that dictators are incredibly oppressive already and incredibly kleptocratic, to give them rewards for this action is even more unconscionable. Oh, so why are the sort of actions you know, exactly that their policy is going to perpetrate? So in the propositions world, dictators will try to outdo each other in terms of the crimes that they commit against their own people. This is because proposition has turned the dictator's cruelty into the perfect bargaining chip. The worse the atrocities, the more eager the international community will be to get these individuals to step down, and so the more extravagant and the more desperate these offers will be forced to become. That's why, as Ben mentioned, and I'm going to explain even more now, dictators often demand that all sorts of conditions be attached to immunity before they even choose to step down, such as the protection of all their embezzled assets or key contacts within the government and the military. So in the past, no thank you, they might not they might have spared a thought for international law. Now they have every reason to make a complete joke out of it. But in contrast to this, our policy does in fact work. And this is why I demonstrate that the criticism of our alternative is null and void. They first talk about why military intervention in many cases causes deaths. And we're very happy to admit that experiences of the past have shown us that we need to be a lot more careful and a lot more considered in the way we carry out military operations. We have several responses to this. First of all, militaries today are a lot better at waging the sort of bush warfare and jungle warfare that these sort of dictators like to use. Secondly, we tell you there have been very positive instances of military intervention. What we need to Lauren Bagbo in the Ivory Coast is a very good illustration of where we successfully managed to remove a dictator by cooperating with local forces who provided us with the expertise we needed to conduct military operations effectively. The next point of attack was that of sanctions. We think that sanctions often are very helpful, so we'd like to recommend that arms embargoes be used instead, because these specifically target the capabilities of a dictator to oppress their own people. What we have is a flexible toolbox which we can adjust, but none of these are ever going to be, but this toolbox is never going to include your policy because it incentivizes this sort of brutality. The case study of the Philippines is a very good illustration. They tried to offer immunity to communist rebels who negotiated for them. Violence increased because now they could only not act with impunity. They wanted to do so because that would force more offers of immunity. That's a real world example where more harm has come about. What have I shown you? Their policy is one which does not save lives and which is hypocritical because it will never work in any real life situation. We are so proud to stand and we oppose. Back to the second of the difference we have from this case. And now to continue the case with the proposition, I call upon Maya Elasco. Big mansion, this is no a big security castle, it is a status we're offering. 
and there are no costs involved. And we have proven you that the risk is worth it. Because the risk of doing any other solution, Point, any other solution is not actually applicable into the cases we have seen. I will continue this point later. So we believe it is the, bad, the best option. That doesn't mean that the rational people of dictators will think it is, but we would love to hear what Benjamin Franklin said about it and how Benjamin Franklin said no to international court, criminal court offering immunity and how the other examples were not suitable for our model because we're proposing an international solution, not, not offered by Spain, not offered by Saudi Arabia. So this model has not been yet applied. The second point that they, it came up is whether or not this brings reconciliation in the country. So I wonder. Point of information, man. Does military intervention in short does reconciliate people inside and brings all the country together? Have we seen that in the last few years? Have we seen that ever in history? So I wonder, and I asked the opposition to tell us that Iraq, invited by the USA, is a reconciliation of the country. Is a making justice. So here comes the issue of their model. This is a disguised military intervention, as much as they like to call it, and it's not only immoral because you're entering with force in a country, it's not reconciliating Point anybody. It's not working. We have seen Iraq, we have seen Libya, we have seen Afghanistan, we have seen Kosovo. Wait a minute, please. Have they given any one example of a military intervention that actually worked? Yes, please. So what are you going to do when your deadline expires and the dictator hasn't accepted the offer of immunity? Okay, let's say that this point has come quite late, but if they don't accept it, what we would propose is, for example, a transitory government or to, I mean, sorry, that comes later, but I mean, we should get the other solutions. But the first option we have to do is to offer the uh, immunity. So this house would offer the immunity first. This is the first step, not going with arms and taking the government away and kill them. So military uh, interventions kills today and kills tomorrow, no matter how nice your weapons are. So you cannot say that military intervention is actually not killing people. So... Point of information, man. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> na then it came to... We need to think about what is the objective of this motion. So the problem, as we stated, is talking about the deaths of people and people who fight and die in vain because they're not taking the government out. We have seen that in Libya and Syria. So we're acting for people. Point of information, man. We're not acting in the name of democracy. We're acting in the name of people. So that's basically the best point because we need to think that if we're not acting against all dictatorships, we're acting in the name of the people who died in vain. I will go to the second point of contention, which is morality. They said it's unethical to guarantee an immunity to people that have done very bad things. But is it more ethical to enter with force and take Point them to get out? Wait a minute, please. So I ask you, I don't know if you know Latin America has, has a lot of dictatorships. Chile, you know Pinochet, was a senator until the day he died. He died last year, I don't know, 2007. And he was a senator in the country in which he had been a dictator. I wonder, is that a punishment? International consensus suggests that both Gaddafi and Bashar al-Assad will lose power soon. Yet they refuse to accept offers okay. of immunity. Can you tell us why? Yes, because they're not worried and they're not fully concerned. And what you're proposing is that we keep waiting and see how many more people are dying instead of doing something today. So if we take Gaddafi and we offer all the immunity from the criminal court and in an international context, we don't know what's going to happen, but we are surely going to take that risk. So they say there are people dying in vain, and we're not acting, as I said before, for democracy, we're just acting in the name of those people that already died in vain. Then it comes the third argument, which is on the long run what's happening. First of all, this is just an offer, so it's not that we're changing the whole status just because. Madam. And they said this will be happening again. So I wonder, we all know dictators. They love power. Becoming a dictator is a quite a long process. We hardly believe that there's a formula called if you have, want to be a dictator, you should have uh, force, charisma, and immunity for after. So a dictator does not think that 
they will be granted immunity after they kill people. A, di a person who oh, wants yeah. to be a dictator will not think about, yes, maybe when I get in power and maybe when I kill thousands, I will get immunity. That's not reality. Dictators don't get into power because they are granted immunity after. It dictators get in power because certain conditions that are not thinking about the consequences. So therefore, they are not thinking that they will be granted immunity or not. So they said that they will have a lot of conditions granted if they want immunity. So if we want to get him out of power, and if that is the objective, we do not enter. We do, we do not need to enter with guns and take him away. We need to stop the massacre. We need to get him out of power so that people stop dying. So we should get over what is done and try to sail, save the present and save the country that you have today. Because what is done is done and you can a country and you cannot wait until a dictatorship suddenly falls into the safe of guns. So basically, we have proven in three main arguments. First of all, life before ethics, in which they couldn't show how military intervention wouldn't kill civilians. Second of all, the only option and how their model and their option, their alternative solution, was, has been doing over and over again and never worked. And third of all, we talked about the consequences in a globalized world and they didn't speak about the fact that doing a military intervention is quite a process that requires such an effort and such a something that is quite not ethical as you're proposing. So at the end of the day, Team Argentina stands for peace, not military intervention. Team Argentina stands for a viable solution and to an offer that is worth taking the risk. Team Argentina stands for saving lives. Thank you very much. ask the House three questions. First, which side saves more lives now? Next, which side saves more lives in the future? Finally, which side is more principally justified? And the answer to all these three questions is the side of the opposition. Let's go to my first question. Who saves more lives now? We think it's our side for the very simple reason that their side's policy is never going to work. From the very beginning of this debate, we've given you principled analysis on why dictators will never accept the offer of immunity. Benjamin came up at first and told you dictators are addicted to power. They told you dictators don't trust the international community because the community has gone back on their word before, in the case of Charles Taylor. Ashish continued this line of rebuttal. We don't think we've heard good analysis from their side of the house in response to this. So we asked them, what happens then? If your policy doesn't work and the dictator doesn't accept immunity, what's going to happen? Finally, we heard an answer in the other speaker. Hang on, what they want is military intervention too. So don't let them make this debate about immunity on one side and military intervention on another side. This debate is about military intervention on both sides of the house, just with an offer of immunity and a waiting period before that. They try to say the waiting period is all right, you know. The waiting period doesn't cause much harm. Let's just give him the offer on the off chance he might accept. But there is a huge problem with the waiting period, the time, the deadline at which the dictator is going to accept it. And Benjamin said this right from the beginning of the debate. The problem is dictators use this time to entrench themselves. They use this time to buy more weapons, kill more people, arm their soldiers. So at the end of the day, when we both get down to the military intervention we accept is the only way to remove dictators, more lives are lost because side proposition has given the dictator more time to prepare. If side proposition really cared about saving lives, they would go in now. They wouldn't give a month, a year of waiting time to dictators, a waiting time that isn't going to prove successful. No thank you, madam. 
Then the proposition tried to attack the policy of military intervention. Firstly, I've shown you why this isn't really realistic, since at the end of the day, they are going to use military intervention for the vast majority of dictators, no thank you ma'am, who aren't going to accept their offer anyway. They try to tell us, we haven't given you a single example of successful military intervention. Really? Right from the beginning of this debate, we talked to you about the Ivory Coast, where military intervention succeeded with very little loss of civilian life. We give you the example of Cambodia, where Vietnam invaded to remove the genocidical Khmer Rouge regime that refused to accept orders of uh, no thank you, sir, offers of immunity, refused to budge after economic and diplomatic sanctions. We have a track record of military intervention being successful. But most importantly, as I said earlier, military intervention is only successful under our side of the house, where we don't give dictators the time period to build up their forces, kill more people, and entrench themselves. We invade now and save lives now. So why that's why we change? save more lives now. Why not? Matter? If it's the same for both sides, then we win because we have a better offer first. No, because I just explained earlier the waiting time that you give a dictator to entrench himself and kill more lives. You're so concerned about the 15,000 people who died in Libya. How many more people are going to die if you wait a year before you finally send the troops in to get rid of Gaddafi? We think your side costs more life because of the waiting period you give a dictator before you're willing to send the troops in. So let's go on to my next point. Who saves more lives in the future? And I'd like to point out once again that the analysis we brought up right from the beginning of the debate remains largely untouched by their sides of the house. We told you you remove the deterrent effect on dictators because fundamentally now you're not punishing dictators for their crimes. The only real response we heard was in their third speaker where she said dictators don't think they're going to be given immunity for their crimes. And yes, that's true, because in the status quo, we don't give dictators immunity for their crime. And look how many dictators we have already. Now, if you add in their policy and say, not only are you going to be given riches and power, and we're going to find it really hard to remove you, but if we do manage to remove you, we're going to let you sit in a comfy villa and enjoy the rest of your life, imagine how many more dictators will come out and start ruling their country. We think that's why the house creates far more dictators. No, thank you, madam. That's why we think they kill more lives in the future. But they never really dealt with my second speaker's point of analysis either. Ashish came up just now in his speech to tell you why dictators are going to be incentivized to kill even more people. Because this forces the international community to become more and more desperate in their what offers of immunity. We didn't hear a response from that side of the house. We think it's too late. Why don't you try now, madam? Uh, we said that we're not trying to avoid dictatorships in the name of democracy, we're just trying to save lives and that is what our offer is proposing. So now you tell us you don't want dictatorships, but then earlier you said you wanted to military, militarily intervene in them. That doesn't make sense. And anyway, if you think about it, it's dictatorships that kill the most people around the world, right? One of the great things about a democratic government is that if they start killing people, you can vote them out of office. So that's what the case really comes down to at the end of the day. A statement that dictatorships are fine. We are okay with them. You know what? We aren't okay with dictatorships. We want to get rid of them and save the lives that they otherwise would have killed. That side of the house is going to result in more deaths in the future. But they also haven't rebutted Benjamin's final point about reconciliation within a country. Because he told you that when you give senior officials of a dictatorship and the dictator vast amounts of immunity and let them walk the streets next to their victims, people are going to get very angry. And that's the catalyst for the sort of violence we saw in places like Iraq. No thank you, madam. The only response was this strange point about Chile towards the end of their third speaker's speech, where she said, you know, in Chile, dictators walk the streets among their people, and every day you see the dictator on the streets. Is this a form of punishment? Precisely, it isn't a form of punishment. When the people go out and see dictators walking on the streets free like them, even though they've got the bloods of thousands of civilians on their hands, no thank you, sir, this isn't a form of punishment. And that's when people are going to get mad. That's when they're going to take the law into their own hands. That's when we see violence and more lives lost. So on that point too, we think in the future, we end up saving far more lives. So let's go on to my final point of contention. Which side is more principally right? And we think it's our side of the house. From the beginning of the debate, we told you this. Yes, it's terrible that so many people have died to overthrow a dictatorship, but let's pause for a moment and ask, why did they die? They died so that their blood and their weapons could be used to overthrow and bring to justice a man who has enslaved their people for decades. It's an insult to everyone who died in Libya for you to now come in and say, okay, you know, you guys have suffered a lot, 
but we're going to remove the, uh, the aim that you were striving towards. We're going to say, it doesn't matter that all of you die. Now we're going to give your dictator immunity. The people of a country who are fighting, fight to see their dictators put into prison. We've said this right from the beginning of this debate, and I'm repeating it again. The only response they had was somehow, you know, we need to save more lives. We agree. We've demonstrated to you earlier why we save more lives. But even if we don't, don't you think you should ask the people in Libya why they're dying? Ask the people in Tunisia why they died? Ask the people in Yemen what they were fighting for? They were fighting for the removal of a dictator, and if they are willing to give up their lives in the struggle, who are we to say you were wrong? We think on this point of justice, our side takes the debate as well. So because we've systemically shown you that dictators are never going to accept an offer of immunity, and they've given us no track record of success. Because at the end of the day, both sides are going to resort to military intervention, and we have the better option of military intervention, because we prevent future dictators from arising, and because we give the people of the country the justice they deserve, and not let them die in vain, go with side opposition. We are faced with many dictators today, and we are presented with a choice. A choice between a side which would use immunity as a tool, a tool for injustice and a tool of failure, in contrast to a side which was willing to stand by military intervention, willing to stand by diplomatic solutions that promote fairness and that promote success. We're going to show why all this is true through two questions. First of all, which side is morally fair? Second, which side really protects life? So let's talk first about which side is morally fair. And what do we see from the side of the proposition? We heard first of all an assertion that dictators wouldn't see immunity as a reward. Dictators and the international community would essentially be able to have a cooperative arrangement and as a consequence, they would come out of power. They kept repeating this, but, we, but they realized it was vacuous following our rebuttals. So they suggested, well, maybe we don't really care about justice. All we're talking about is this idea of life and life being important above everything life being important above the sacrifices made by victims of dictatorial oppression which we raised from the beginning of the debate. The problem was, when pushed further, they realised that this yardstick of morality didn't stand either. And that's why they conceded in a point of information later in the debate that they were willing to consider the use of the International Criminal Court, use of ultimatums following, uh, following which military intervention could be pursued, all of which suggestions which were made right at the beginning by side opposition. And that's why their case by the end of the debate reduced itself to a hypothetical when they asked us, what if immunity might just be a better offer? Quite clear evidence they were never able to show us why immunity would ever work in the real world. By contrast, we showed you quite clearly why morality stood on our side because we talked about how it, reward, how it would reward brutality. We talked about how we wouldn't have a deterrent effect against the rise of future dictators and how heinous crimes would go unpunished. They didn't care to rebut our international precedents that we raised from the beginning of the debate. All they chose to do was raise a list of military interventions they claimed were bad and that's why we think on the question of morality it was side opposition that took them to fail. Let's now talk about protecting life. And here, what we heard again coming out of side proposition was an assertion that their offer was going to stop dictators from killing people. 
but they realized this assertion was hollow, and that's why they had to move to an alternative argument which suggested that other methods simply don't work. They talked about the failings of diplomatic isolation and economic sanctions, claiming immunity was the only option. But they reneged on this commitment by the end of the debate by saying that, well, we'll go back to these alternative solutions if we decided that the offer of immunity wouldn't work. That's why we never saw a direct justification from their side of why their chosen mechanism of immunity to dictators was ever going to work. All they said was, well, it's new, it's something we've never tried before on the part of the international community. That's what their third speaker said. That's why they never proved it. Instead, on side opposition, we provide a very layered analysis. We talk about why we save lives now, because we don't allow dictators to use cruelty as a bargaining chip against the world. We talk about how we save lives in the future, because we stop future dictators from rising, not that they're afraid immunity won't occur. They never rebutted our argument about violence that would occur if we took out the dictator using immunity between the victims and the people who previously supported the dictator. And that's why, by the end of the debate, the main substantive argumentation we raised continued to stand. Today, what has opposition shown? We've shown that justice prevails and life is saved when we don't give those who renege on the most basic of humanitarian norms a free ticket to a villa in Italy. democracy. We have to end the dictatorships. They took on a much greater burden than it actually solved the situation which we are facing today. The situation we are trying to solve and the situation that immunity is trying and it's going to solve. Further on, how are we going to do this? This was the clash of the two models, which was one of the biggest clashes in the whole debate. The practicality, effectivity, it's blah, 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 blah. How are we going to do it? The, the proposition came out and said that what we should do is offer immunity. If they accept it, then we can end this. And if they don't accept it, as my third speaker said, we're going to see later on. They misquoted us, they misrepresented us by saying what they what we said, what we said is that after the meeting we're going to intervene militarily. But my third speaker said quite clearly that we'll see later on and see the options. But the fact is what we're trying to analyze today in this motion is the offer of immunity or not. Not within 20 years time after an offer or before an offer or something with an offer, we're going to do something else, ladies and gentlemen. On the other hand, the proposition came out, the opposition came out, sorry for that, with what we should do is intervene militarily. Why? Because it's gonna get rid of the dictator and it's not gonna really cost us lives because thanks to technology, militarily, military action does not actually cost as many lives as it did. But ladies and gentlemen, last time I checked and last time the entire proposition checked as the um, cases we gave of Kosovo, of Libya, of Iraq, of so many cases where military intervention has cost more lives because technology, thank God, now can kill more people at a faster rate. So, ladies and gentlemen, this proves that military intervention is not a solution to the fact that people are dying and innocents are dying. And military intervention will not solve this but exacerbate this as we have proved, as will other solutions like economic sanctions and diplomatic isolation, which my second speaker developed, 
which shows that we have to look for another solution. And what is the solution to the question we're asking? The solution is immunity. That's what the solution is. So, ladies and gentlemen, after we have decided what we are trying to do, which is end the crisis now, and how we're going to do it, which is immunity, as I've shown you, why are we doing it in the first place? I mean, what's the whole point of this? Why should we save lives, ladies and gentlemen? Well, what we said is we should save lives because these are innocent people which have not hurt any, anybody and do not deserve to die for this cause. The opposition, on the other hand, said they're choosing to sacrifice their lives, so, so be it. But ladies and gentlemen, we should put lives above everything else. If there's one thing that we should cherish in our life, is life itself. Because in the case of the man who incinerated himself in Libya, who's going to give his sister back a brother? Who's going to bring back to her, to her, his crying mother a son who brought the groceries every Sunday and who went to eat with her every Sunday, ladies and gentlemen? That is no justice in that sacrifice because there is no point in sacrificing one's life for, for this cause. So, further on, they said, the opposition said, well, apart from the sacrifice that they are choosing to take, what we should do is employ military intervention because of the punishment it brings to the dictator and the deterrence effect. But ladies and gentlemen, as I quite clearly stated, violence does not actually bring justice because in the end, as they said, you kill the dictator and there is no trial in that. And second of all, where is the deterrence effect if for the past hundred years we have used military intervention in so many wars which we have quite clearly explained and we still have these dictators at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why Immunity is the option we must take because it ends the crisis now, because it offers no cost and only gives us gains, and because it saves innocence and the lives of many people who should not risk their lives for this cause. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We have been made to feel warmly welcome, which is doubly important, on this, which is the very first round of this particular competition. And I know that a number of the teams have been here in Scotland for a few days already, and they've already enjoyed the warm hospitality of people all around the country, particularly here in Dundee. But it makes it doubly special to be able to come here today to feel welcome in your school. And before I do anything else, I just wanted to say, in light of this being the very first round, um, how admirably we thought that all of these debaters performed. I think they did a terrific job at demonstrating to you the reasons why these people travel all over the world to learn from and about different debating styles and to debate against each other is it so that they can develop their own skills and then show them off to people like yourselves. So before we talk anything about the result, could I ask you please to say a huge round of applause. So you can maybe pick your own favourite as to whichever one you want to go along to if you get the chance to see them today. Now as judges, of course, we, we don't have favourites. Uh, it's our role to sort of judge the debate impartially. It's, it's a bit of a di difficult job in some ways because uh, debating, it's a bit subjective, naturally. You know, it's always just one person's opinion. So if you have three judges in a room, you could have five judges or seven judges or nine judges. They could all potentially come up with a different way of seeing a debate. But it is also objective in the sense that we tend to, to, to judge debates according to a certain set of criteria. Those criteria that we look at, we examine the speaker's content, so the arguments that they put forward to persuade you why their case was right. We also judge the style that they use, so the way in which they speak, and we also judge the strategy that they have to make sure that their speech feels like a nice, tightly packed unit but also how well that speech responds to the rest of the debate. So those are the three things that the judges look at in terms of assessing which of these particular teams um, were worked out to be the winner. Uh, the good news I have for you is, of course, although, as I said, judges can be different, the three judges we had today saw this debate um, in a very similar, similar manner. Uh, and so I won't give you the result just yet, because I'll keep you on tender hooks for a moment, but <laughs> not for much more than a moment. To explain to you where we got to the position, we thought that the... Proposition team at the start of the debate set out 
a very clear case of what they were arguing. So it was quite clear that from the motion that you'd been given, what they stood for was a particular proposition or a model for immunity for dictators, bringing in extra elements that some of you may know of or some of you may not to do with the ICC and other particular uh, regions and countries that have been affected by them in the past. Uh, so we thought it was very good that we had a nice clear um, set of, uh, of, of parameters for the debate to be established first up. The, uh, the opposition attacked them uh, for a while and saying, well, you know, this, would it work? You know, and, and of course the, the proposition said, well, ultimately they said, well, we, because it's a new model, you know, we can't point to a, a case where it has worked in the past. Uh, and also, you know, we, we don't necessarily know whether it, it will work in the future. So that was one thing where the opposition did well to, to weaken some part of the proposition team's case. However, uh, that's, that's not quite enough on its own for the opposition to knock down the proposition team's case when the opposition were arguing throughout the debate that when it comes to dealing with dictators, there is a whole toolbox, is the phrase they used, and we commented particularly on the excellent choice of words a lot of the debaters had. We thought that was a lovely phrase. A toolbox of different options available to us to deal with dictators. So even if this wasn't necessarily a, an amazing one, or even if it wouldn't be accepted very often, then at least maybe it's still part of that toolbox. So the opposition would have to do a little bit more to, to show it was a bad idea. And they, they went on to try to show how it would in fact be counterproductive. Uh, and on these particular areas, uh, we thought there were a couple of places where they were able to put material onto the table to show us that, in fact, the amount of time it might take for that offer to be outstanding before it would be accepted to end up with the toolbox of options that they talked about, that sort of time might, in fact, be the harm that would be come out of this particular proposal that was put forward. And so we had a debate about sort of when that was put forward and how well that was put forward. But at the end of the day, we decided that it was the approach to that particular issue and the analysis of the examples coupled with their style, which meant that in a debate where both teams did very well and we complemented both teams on a very good debate, unfortunately it can only be one winner, and in this case it's the opposition from Singapore.